So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about PARP inhibitors. Now, this is something that I think is well known in the internal you know, medical community because PARP inhibitors are being used in other cancers, but now they're starting to come up in prostate cancer. So I thought you know, we could talk about the placement of them. You know, Is this something that's approved now or it's something we can look forward to in the future? And really, where it's going to work in the sequencing of treatment. So first of all, what is a PARP inhibitor? I would describe it as a type of chemotherapy, except it uh, comes in a pill form rather than the traditional injected form. When we talk about chemotherapy and prostate cancer, it's usually just a couple medicines, Taxotere and Jeftana. The PARP inhibitors like uh, Olaparib and Rucaparib are, are pills that you take once or twice a day and have a lot of similarities to regular chemotherapy. They don't usually cause much hair loss, but they can cause some fatigue and low blood counts, which is a characteristic of chemotherapy in general. When it comes to PARP inhibitors, you know, how does it work in the body? Is it, you know, gonna, is a systemic therapy? Yeah, it uh, circulates throughout the bloodstream and uh, the cancer cells that are susceptible to this particular poison, this particular chemotherapy will die off. These have been demonstrated effective in prostate cancer, particularly in prostate cancers that have been documented to have a certain genetic deficiency called BRCA. There are some other genetic deficiencies, uh, ATM, and there's a list of these genetic deficiencies that uh, may be more responsive. There's one study that, ha that was published showing that when combined with Zytiga, which is the same thing as abiraterone, that Olaparib uh, became even more effective. And in those particular individuals, they didn't have to have the genetic deficiency to experience a benefit. Sort of an unusual group uh, that were getting Zytiga for the first time. I don't know that we're seeing that many of these types of patients in the United States, but outside the country, it's probably more common. How do you know if you have a genetic deficiency? Uh, there are blood tests such as Garden 360 or Foundation One, which can um, tell you if you if you are an individual that uh, has this particular type of prostate cancer with the genetic deficiency of BRCA or one of the other mutations I mentioned. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that we are a nonprofit organization who are creating these videos and we're only able to do it because of people who have donated just like you. If you would like to join our cause and donate, you can do that at PCRI.org. Now back to our video on PARP inhibitors. So are these PARP inhibitors FDA approved and easy to access, you know, for patients who are getting BRCA testing and then, you know, this may be the next step for them? Yes, they are. To my knowledge, to uh, medications approved right now. One is called uh, Olaparib, which is uh, also called Linparza, and the other one is called Rucaparib. What is the percentage likelihood of a patient being diagnosed with BRCA? So in the advanced disease setting, it's about 10 to 12, maybe 15 percent of patients will have these types of genetic deficiencies. So that was what was sort of surprising about the study published with Olaparib, where they didn't even do genetic testing and still showed a wider benefit and when I looked at that study carefully, it was uh, sort of an unusual patient base. They were men that had uh, uh, become hormone resistant, the Lupron had stopped working, and about a fourth of them had had previous chemotherapy. None of them had had any previous abiraterone. And in the study, they randomized men to abiraterone alone or abiraterone plus olaparib. And the combination did better regardless of what the genetic background was. In other studies uh, where they've done genetic testing or they've administered these uh, PARP inhibitors to people without the genetic deficiency, they didn't really work that well. Is the Zytiga plus Olaparib combination somehow synergistic uh, that uh, created more efficacy even in patients that didn't have uh, genetic abnormalities? We don't really know. Uh, we do know that it postponed uh, disease progression to a significant degree. So to my understanding as I'm reading about this, one of the things that's coming up is, you know, where is this gonna happen in the sequencing? Do you take this before chemotherapy? Do you take this before hormone therapy? Does it all have to be after? When is insurance gonna cover it? Like how is this playing out in world world practice? Well, I think to get insurance coverage, people will have to have been uh, become resistant to Lupron. They'll have to have developed what we call hormone resistance. The uh, question of sequencing thereafter is, uh, is interesting because in my, our practice, we're giving a lot of second generation hormonal therapy before people become hormone resistant. 
and that uh, it improves the longevity of the hormone treatment and allows people to have longer responses. In many other practices, there's a sequence of give Lupron until it stops working, then give uh, a second generation hormonal agent such as abiraterone or Extandi or perhaps Nubeca or Erlita. And then when that stops working, give them uh, Provenge or chemo uh, and, uh, in a sequence such as that. If people are becoming hormone resistant on the combination of a second generation hormonal agent plus Lupron, then the options would be Rucaparib, Olaparib, Taxotere, Jevtana. And I think patients are going to lean more towards the Rucaparib and Olaparib options just because they're pills. They, uh, uh, men aren't probably going to pursue it if they don't have one of these genetic mutations such as BRCA. But if they are BRCA positive, then the response rates are about 50%. And the, um, the convenience of taking a pill, I think is very attractive. So when we talked about chemotherapy, you know, we were talking about since it is systemic and the chemo is going all over our body that, you know, we can, you can have hair loss and it can affect your nails and salivary glands. If you're taking a pill and it is still systemic, um, how do you control those factors? Well, that's, I suppose, another attractive thing of Linparza and Drucaparib is that the incidence of hair loss is less. The other side effects that we associate with chemotherapy, uh, such as low blood counts and fatigue, uh, sometimes some GI nausea issues like that are an issue. It is chemotherapy, but uh, the absence of hair loss is, uh, is an attractive thing to avoid. Not everybody that gets taxiterin jevtana has hair loss, but a good 50% of people who get those chemotherapies have significant hair loss. So what about PSA response? You know, how long till you see a, you know, maybe it's stabilizing or declining? Yes, we do look for a PSA response. And I would typically wait about 60 days of ongoing treatment before making a judgment as to whether the, uh, the treatment is getting traction in that individual patient. We would like to see if the PSA had been previously rising, which in most cases it is, We'd like to see at least the beginnings of stabilization, if not a reversal in the uh, way the PSA is acting over time while getting these therapies. You know, you mentioned BRCA testing, and I know that um, in certain circles this is pretty popular, but for patients who are new to prostate cancer and are still learning about this, what is BRCA? How is it going to affect, you know, the outcome? And most of all, I think when it comes to this, you know, is there any access to these types of PARP inhibitors if patients don't have, you know, the BRCA mutation? Because in that study it was mentioned, but it doesn't sound like they have access. Well, I don't know exactly how it's going to shake out for insurance coverage, but the BRCA mutation is a, um, an abnormality that uh, about 10% of advanced patients have. And it does uh, sig signal a somewhat more aggressive type of prostate cancer. So it is good to be aware of it. And as we've mentioned already, there are simple blood tests such as Foundation 1 and Garden 360 that um, get, they can make the diagnosis. So men that are developing androgen independence certainly want to have that type of genetic testing to find out where they fit in the spectrum. The overall toler tolerability of these medicines is, uh, I think, as good as it is with chemotherapy. It's, it's a dose-related phenomena. The policies oftentimes used in clinical trials is they start people out on a big dose and then when the they can't handle it, they'll cut the dose back. We don't use that policy in my practice. We start out on a smaller dose to make sure that the patients can handle the smaller dose, and then we slowly escalate the dose as tolerated. When people get bad chemotherapy side effects, it's, it can really knock you down, and, and it can be hard to come back from that. So I think that the policy of maybe starting out at a 75% dose the first month and then go up to 100% dose the second month and then uh, check the PSA monthly. And hopefully, you'll start to see some uh, attenuation of the PSA and then a decline. We'd like to see a substantial decline in PSA over time. So how will PSMA be used when it comes to PARP inhibitors? They always want to have a baseline. So when you're beginning a new treatment, whether it's a PARP inhibitor or chemotherapy or whatever, uh, it's good to get a baseline. And we've converted to just doing PSMA PET scans. We don't do old-fashioned bone scans or CAT scans anymore. So a PSMA PET scan at the same time that you're initiating the new treatment. Check the PSA monthly and see if, if things are responding. And then 
if you get to a point where you're thinking of making a change or the PSA has stopped declining, get another scan and see, see where you stand. So today we talked about PARP inhibitors and prostate cancer. I could not encourage you more. Please go get BRCA tested if you are in an advanced category. You know, these may be a couple other tools that are options for you, and it may have a really good effect, and it's good to know that you're expanding your options. You know your particular case. When I think of BRCA testing, I think of it just as important as knowing your PSA levels or getting imaging and having those scans. It's really important to get the best full picture view of your prostate cancer case, and this helps you get a much better outcome. If your physician is saying you don't need it, you know, get a second opinion, just make sure you advocate for yourself because it's always important that you're in charge of your health. Please remember if you need help with your specific case, you can contact us at pcri.org forward slash helpline. And those helpline facilitators have had prostate cancer. They've had advanced disease. They, they know the newly, newly diagnosed space. They know a lot of different circumstances and they've been trained by our medical oncology team. So they're able to answer a lot of questions. It's not advice. It's information. But that information can help you build up your information and education so that you can go again, have a better outcome with your team. Please remember that we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so if you would like to join us in donating and helping getting these videos out across the world, you can do that at pcri.org forward slash donate. And thank you so much for trusting us. I hope you have a great week. Please remember, you're not alone.